Good afternoon. How's everybody? We have Jeremy Jordan here today. Thank you, Mara, and good afternoon. My guest is one of this decade's most respected young leading men working on stage, screen, and television. He made his Broadway debut in the musical Rock of Ages, followed by such roles as Tony in West Side Story, Jack Kelly in Disney's Newsies. Newsies fans? Yeah. Fabulous. And Clyde Barrow in the Frank Wildhorn and Don Black musical Bonnie and Clyde. Oh, yes. We co starred opposite Laura Osnes. He created the role of J.M. Barry for director Diane Paulus in the musical Finding Neverland at ART. On television, he played Jimmy on the NBC series Smash. Smash fans here today? <laughs> Voiced the role of Varian in Disney's Channel's animated series Tangled and is known to legions of fans for playing Wynn in the hit TV series Supergirl. <laughs> on film, he starred opposite Dolly Parton and Queen Latifah in Joyful Noise. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and is Jamie opposite Anna Kendrick in the last five years? We'll find out what it was like singing live through that whole film. Well, now he's returned to Broadway, starring alongside Kerry Washington, Stephen Pasquale, and Eugene Lee in Christopher Demos Brown's new play, American Son, directed by Kenny Leon. Please welcome Jeremy Jordan. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Ah, yeah. <laughs> so weird sitting back there and you're just introducing me and I'm just sitting behind the stage just like. He's the most humble oh. person I have ever met. It's, well. It's like you watch your life flash before you write your career. A little bit, yeah. a little bit. Through somebody else's eyes though and you're yeah. like, oh, huh? Well, first off, welcome back to Broadway. Yeah. How does it feel? How does it feel? Yes. It feels great. I miss Broadway. I haven't been here since 2012, so it's been, Six years, and I'm super happy to be back, and it, it's great. I mean, I, I didn't miss the not-so-great dressing room situation on Broadway, <laughs> but other than that, it's been great. <laughs> and coming back in a play, you've always wanted to do a play on Broadway, yeah. didn't you? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I uh, my, actually, my very first professional gig uh, was a play I did in Hartford. I did The Little Dog Laughed uh, right out of college, and then somebody heard that I could sing, and then I've just been doing musicals ever since. So I've kind of wanted to sort of, uh, you know, have people sort of see me a little bit more broadly and, and, and sort of, well, one of the reasons that I, that I decided to do Supergirl and go out for pilot season was because I didn't want to be sort of stuck in that box of just the guy that can sing. Because even all the TV film stuff that I, could, that I did was all singing, uh, or at least had singing elements. And so when I got Supergirl, it was a big deal for me so that I could do something that didn't involve my voice. Then, of course, like, they made me sing <laughs> eventually. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, when I got done with that and American Sun came my way, it just felt like the really the perfect next little step for me so that I can sort of, you know, broaden my career and, and, and uh, try to not limit myself to just this one little thing. Even, even though, you know, I do love to sing and I know that people kind of have grown to expect that from me. But you know, you try to challenge expectations every once in a while and, and surprise people and surprise yourself. Yeah. And uh, you know, I've certainly learned a lot doing this show, so. Well, how did American Sun come about for you? Uh, American Sun uh, kind of came to me uh, at the perfect time. I had just gotten back. Uh, I'd been home for, from Vancouver where I uh, left the show Supergirl after three years. Uh, I had come home back to New York. Um, I was home for maybe two, three weeks, and uh, my manager called me, and after 30 minutes of like talking about random stuff, he's like, oh, and by the way, <laughs> oh, and by the way, you know, uh, we might be getting an offer for this play for you. I was like, oh, really? I was like, well, where is it? He's like, it's on Broadway. I was like, what? <laughs> you could have led with that. <laughs> so, he, uh, but it, I don't think it was like, uh, you know, it wasn't, they wanted to talk about it and figure it all out. So I read it, and I was like, we gotta make this happen. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I, I remember getting it at like, it was really late at night because they were out in LA, so I was reading it before going to bed and I had already like sort of dozed off and I was like, oh, I'll just look at the character description <laughs> and it was like 12.30 and then, and then like 2 a.m. I'm like, <sighs> like shaking my wife like, hey, this is awesome. And she's like, I'm 
talk about it in the morning. But it was, yeah, it was definitely one of those things. As soon as I read it, I was like, this, I have to do this. Well, let's tell everybody who hasn't seen the show yet what the play is about. So American Son, um, I am not the son. <laughs> I am somebody's son. But uh, no, the American Sun basically takes place uh, in present day uh, Miami, Florida, uh, at a police station at 4 a.m. in the morning. A woman, a uh, black woman, comes in uh, looking for her son. He hasn't shown, he hasn't come home. 18 year old kid, his car is missing. Uh, she, she's been calling him, she can't find out where he is. And uh, she had called the police station. They, they had mentioned that something, that the car had sh his car had shown up in their records. And so she starts freaking out, comes down to the station, meets my character, who's really the only guy, officer, working there at four in the morning. He's the new guy, so <laughs> he is, they have some, some issues. And, uh, and eventually we meet uh, her husband, who is a white man. And, and the play really deals with a lot of racial issues, uh, in, uh, uh, interracial marriage, uh, biracial children, uh, really police, uh, race sort of relationships as well and and it's really just about how people don't communicate as well as they should about these sorts of things people sort of build up these these walls and you know we we tend to stay within the safe zone whenever we're talking to somebody that is maybe a little bit different than us um, and so because of the situation and the circumstance those walls just kind of get shattered in our play and we go there we talk about all the things and and it's uncomfortable, and some audiences are, have a difficult time watching it, and some audiences are just like, thank you for talking about this yeah. sort of stuff. And um, it's a, just a really beautiful, truthful play um, about the sort of the current state of our country. And uh, what I really love about it is that there are four characters um, that are very different and very diverse in their views and their viewpoints and who they are and where they have come from, that we as audience members can really find something at least with every one of them that we can agree with. And then those things, we sort of get beaten down and sort of like, oh, wait, those, that character actually isn't always right or always perfect. Or like every sort of viewpoint is challenged and sort of also, you know, vindicated at the same time. It's, it's, it's a really well-written play. Talk about your writer. Our writer is a uh, man named Chris Demos Brown, who is a lawyer from Miami. Um, this is his first Broadway show. I mean, he's been writing uh, plays, but this is his his big break. Uh, he's a he's a white guy um, who is incredibly woke, as they say, uh, and just a really really smart individual and and a, and a lovely person. Uh, uh, I know that he had had um, a couple of serious relationships with black women, so I think that he was able to have that white man, black woman relationship really well down. And he was also uh, in law enforcement for a while, so he kind of has that sort of thing. He's, he's a great dude. Yeah. Talk about your role without giving too much away. Okay, well my role, I play the young police officer named uh, Officer Larkin. Uh, he uh, is, uh, he's, he's pretty smart, although he's, he's you know, from the South, and has that sort of, sort of idea that he knows more than he really does. You know what I'm saying? And that, that sort of, he, he sort of is a victim, in a way, of that sort of casual, middle-class white racism that you don't really know what you're saying. You don't really, you're not sort of aware of it. And, uh, and, he, and we, he, he becomes aware of it throughout the play, I think, eventually. Um, but he, uh, you know, he's, he's trying to be helpful. I think he, he has bigger aspirations. He wants to be in the FBI. And, um, and uh, he's stuck here in the middle of the night trying to deal with this woman who is growing increasingly more hysterical as I'm not able to help her and she is not able to find her son. And he doesn't really know how to deal with it. Um, and then he meets another character, which is Steve Pasquale's character, who he kind of can become buddy buddy with, and they kind of he kind of becomes teammates with him, which, in a weird way, sort of goes against this this sort of white dudes against the black woman. It, it's it's very it's it becomes very uncomfortable to watch, but um, it, you know, it's he's he's just really trying to uh, he's he's trying to be helpful. He's trying to. Um, you know, navigate all of his responsibilities as a police officer and f 
follow protocols while at the same time sort of having compassion. And it, and, uh, it really shows a lot of the issues, I think, that, that young, especially white police officers, but police officers in general, have to deal with on a daily basis. You know, they have to skirt these issues, this very fine line between like remaining, you know, truthful to their, you know, the oaths that they took to maintain the law and try to also be helpful to people and try to also, you know, bend the rules so that they can feel their sense of compassion uh, at the same time. And it's, it's a very difficult job because you know, it, it, it's, it's, it rests on, you know, just a needle point because it can really just fall over into, you know, like, oh, well, you're being racist or you're being, you know, or you're not, you know, being helpful enough or you're not actually protecting us, you're actually hurting us because you're doing whatever sort of thing. So he's really trying to navigate that the entire play. How exciting and challenging is it doing a new play? Oh, it's so exciting. Um, uh, you know, I've... I, you know, I've, I've, I've done a few new musicals and I've certainly done a lot of stuff that has never been done before, whether it's TV or movie or Broadway. Um, but this feels different in that it feels important. I feel like it's been a long time, or if ever, that I've really been a part of something that feels necessary to, you know, humanity, uh, our time. It's like something that I feel like people need to see and need to hear. And I read that, and I, I read, when I read the play, I, I thought that immediately. Like, I, uh, even though, it, you know, it's a supporting role, and, you know, previously on Broadway, I've done leading roles, and I couldn't not sort of find myself within this, this world and telling the story, because, you know, it, it, there's a lot of things happening in our country right now, and a lot of them are negative. And one of them, I think, that is universally across the board and everybody can agree on is negative is how we deal with race in the country and how we're all so stuck with it. And, and we don't know how to sort of talk to, pe talk to each other anymore. You know, it's everybody is really, really uh, closed off and, and, um, and afraid all the time. And this play tries to combat that and tries to get people to talk. And um, in terms of it just being a new play on Broadway, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, I don't know what else I could ask for. I mean, you know, I would love to do a really cool revival one day. I've never really done that uh, except for West Side Story. But um, just being back on Broadway and coming to the city every day and, and seeing the lines and the theaters and the crowds and sort of trying to remember every day before you step on stage that, there's somebody out in the audience that this is their first show or this show can change their life or, or be something that they'll remember forever and maybe lead them to do something great. Um, it's something, it, it, it helps, it, it, it's, it's good to be here because you can feel the audience's energy. Because even doing TV shows and stuff, you can still inspire people, but it's, you're so far removed from that that you can't really feel that energy except for like if you go to a Comic Con or something like that. And, and here it's just like it's everywhere and it's, and it's full and it really fills your heart and it makes you feel like you have some sort of purpose. It makes you feel like I'm doing something positive for the world, uh, which is strange to think when I decided that I was going to become an actor and performer that I was going to be like <laughs> making somebody other than myself feel good. <laughs> but yeah, it's great. The four of you work perfectly together. Yeah. What's it like sharing the stage with Kerry Washington, Stephen Pasquale, Eugene Lee, the four of you up there? Uh, we have a blast. I mean, from, the, from the, the first day that we really got together in the rehearsal room, we really just bonded and meshed really quickly, and we, our energies really work really well together. Um, we're all very different, but also very focused on on the exact same product, like we're trying to do the same thing. A lot of shows and a lot of, a lot of times you'll see people, you're like, oh, that person's doing a different play than that person. Or this play is directed somehow, but like you're doing something and you're doing something and everybody's looking out for number one, but we're really looking out for the play. And it was one of the first times that I've really felt trust on all facets of the things, you know, the director, the writing, the acting. Usually, I mean, the past three years I've been doing television, which has a lot of great things to it, but it's so fast and so furious. You're getting a new director every episode. You, you, know, you have the scripts coming in like this and you're trying to massage it to make it perfect and feel right for you and then it's done and you don't try, all, all you have is yourself. And uh, here, 
um, I was, we were really able to trust material and trust each other. And, um, and it's, it's gotten to the point now that when we're doing the show, we really can just like be connected and, and see each other in our, in, in a, uh, you know, look each other in the eyes and really find new moments and trust that the other person is going to be there for us to kind of like navigate that while still maintaining, you know, the, the uh, integrity of the play. <laughs> Granted, there are some days where the lines become something new and we have to, <laughs> but even, even more important for those kinds of days to have that trust because there are days where we'll skip like three lines and be like, well, that was really important information. <laughs> How do we put that back in and not completely throw ourselves off and not make the audience be like, what is happening on stage? So those are always fun. For those of you who have not seen this, it's electrifying. It, the four of them, it just, it crackles on stage. It's one of the best shows you will see. It's some of the four of the best performances you'll ever see on a Broadway stage. I mean, it's, it's 85 yeah. minutes, yeah. and m most people, what they say at the end was like, I, I didn't breathe for yeah. the entire time. Yeah. There's no intermission, and it's like one of those things by, at the end, you're just like, yeah. okay. <laughs> some people just don't even clap, too. What's funny, because we changed the curtain call halfway through previews because it felt too, like, congratulatory of ourselves. And so, like, what happened at the end is the curtain would go down and then it'd come up on an empty stage and then we'd make our way on, Eugene, and then me, then Steve, and then Carrie. And it was, like, very traditional. And now at the end, uh, we all stay on stage at the end and the curtain comes back up. We can just kind of, like, stand there and just kind of sit there with it so the audience and us, it, it sort of gives the message to the audience, like, think about what you just saw. Yeah. Don't think about us. Don't congratulate us right away. Just sit here and consider what we just gave you, what we all just experienced together. And then we'll do the bows because everybody wants to clap. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Well, so much of this has to do with your incredible director. You're working with Kenny Leon. Yeah. What makes him one of the most sought after directors? I mean, one, the trust thing yeah. is a big thing. I mean, he is, he, his big, one of his biggest things is all on the bed, all on the floor, which is a yeah. thing from his grandma about like, you know, there was somebody that, you know, if there, was, if there wasn't enough beds, yeah. then everybody slept on the floor sort of a thing. And that's his sort of philosophy with theater. So if one person is late, everybody does push-ups, uh, which we only had to do twice. I was gonna ask you about the push-ups. We, we only did twice, Okay. and it was never me. <laughs> so, okay. Just got that one out. Okay. <laughs> but 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 the but other other uh, you know beside that it's just like we all have to be in the same play in the same yeah. moment together. We all have to like be breathing the same air and like feeling the same energy zipping back and forth between us. Oh, yeah. And uh, and there's a lot of trust going both ways with that. And um, but the best thing for me with Kenny um, was that uh, I don't even know if he meant to do this, but he like really reformed a lot of my ideas uh, about being an actor. You know, I have been doing, like I keep saying, I've been doing TV and I've done a lot of other things in my career where I have had to take what was given to me and make it that. You know, make it better, make it, massage it and kind of like find the little nuggets in there and bring that out and bring that out. And it's really exciting to do that. Um, and sometimes it's difficult because you feel like, ah, I wish that it just was that, and then I can do that on this scale instead of like, mm, mm. it's like instead of like, ha. And this particular piece was that, was that. And I still approached it like this. And, like, and he's like, what are you doing? Like, why are you, why did you make that word like longer? Like, why are you saying like, is he wearing a shirt? Like, why are you, why are you saying, is he wearing a shirt? Like, just yeah. say it. That's not a line from the play. I didn't give anything away. <laughs> I was just think, trying to think of a word to say. But like, I would do that every once in a while. And like, he's like, you're trying to, you're, you're bringing that like comedy. I mean, I spent a lot of time doing comedy. And so like, the char my character, uh, if you see the show, can really, really very easily teeter onto that comedy. And he does, but it's more like situational comedy other than like me trying to bring more funny to the show. Because I think we, just, we found out really, really early on that if we bring too much comedy to the show, people are ready to laugh more 
more, they're more ready to laugh as the play goes on and gets more serious. And then the serious things don't hit as well because people are like, when's the next funny thing? You know, um, but, but he, he really taught me to trust the words. Um, and he gave me a little slip of paper one day after sort of reaming me the day before. <laughs> and this slip of paper just said, you are good enough to just say these words. And I was like, it's, it's weird because if I had gotten that out of any other context, I feel like I might have been offended. Because like, I have never been the guy to just like show up and say the things on the page. I'm like always bringing something new to it or something interesting and finding nuggets. And I think that is valuable. But when something is so beautifully written and kind of perfect, you say the words and everything around it falls into place. And then those tiny little energies become so minuscule that you can't even see them, but you're still bringing them. So instead of like making a choice and it's visible to even the audience that that's the choice you made, you're making a choice that's so minor, minor and minuscule that it feels natural, but it also feels personal and it also feels nuanced, but it's, but it's not obvious. So people are just sitting there experiencing the play. So, it was a big lesson for me to learn, and I had to kind of undo a lot of the things that I had done over the years of, you know, doing this to a lot of pieces, you know, like doing workshops of musicals that, you know, needed a lot of work, and I'm trying to, like, show it to producers and be like, here, this can be good, I promise, you know? <laughs> or, you know, taking a TV script that was written the night before and be like, come on, all right. If I change this word around, if I really, ah, I can make that funny, you know, and this, it, and I, it, what, I talked to Kenny about that specific sort of thing, and um, I was like, I just want you to know, you know, like you've really changed my outlook on performing and on acting, um, you know, and I can't. And he's like, well, you know, that's one of my main sort of thought, my, one of my goals is to take, is to do the work on the material, and then by the end of that work, the actor has something new to take to the next piece. And that's what I really feel excited about. Like whatever comes next, I'm like, ah, I have so many new tools. And I have so many, so much more, uh, you know, within me and more ideas about how I can do certain things. You know, of course, because of course, that the character that I'm working on right now has a very limited set of things that he's done that he does in the show. You know, and uh, but I feel like the things that I learned from Kenny, I can implement on a much greater scale. Yeah. So. He's brilliant at what he does. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, he's pretty good. <laughs> yep, he's pretty good. Let's go back to the beginning. Growing up in Texas, where did your love for performing begin, and what were your earliest creative outlets? Wow. Um, well, growing up, I, my grandma used to run a community theater youth program. So like, she did all like, the kitty plays at the community theater. And so she would sometimes, you know, uh, volunteer, my brother and I, <laughs> to come and do the shows. And it was fun, but like, whatever. And, um, and uh, so that was like my first introduction to it, but I wasn't super hooked on it. I was just like something silly to do. Yeah. Like I would go and make faces and like, you know, say funny, silly things on stage and then go eat McDonald's or something, you know? And so... <laughs> Like, it didn't really impact me. And then I, I realized I could sing kind of at an early age. And um, I would always, but I was always so shy. So I'd like sing in the shower and my mom would, she told me this years later that she would like crack the door open and like sit there and listen. I was, I was like my boy soprano, Celine, singing Celine Dion in the shower. So she finally got me uh, uh, the courage to go audition for a couple of musicals. And uh, turns out I, could not act to save my life. So even though I could sing, I didn't get those. So I went to choir instead, because choir doesn't involve acting. And so I went into choir and sort of fell in love with that world and, uh, and grew, learned to grow as a singer. And then eventually, um, I think eventually I kind of grew up and matured and started to listen. And I think that was the key to unlocking my ability as an actor, which, which was listening. Which is funny because how it came about was I was a sophomore or junior in high school and I was auditioning for a play called The Fantastics, which was here yeah. uh, for a long time. And there is a character in it called The Mute 
who doesn't say or speak or sing. It's a musical. And I'm like, <laughs> and the director somehow saw something in me. And he was like, well, we're going older for the casting, so I can't cast you for the boy, even though you are a boy, and the person playing the boy is like 35, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> but we're going to have you as the mute. I was like, great, I have nothing better to do. <laughs> but what it, what it did was it taught me to listen, and I, and I suddenly like was paying attention to everything else going around me and reacting to it, and I was like, oh, this is really fun. I'm not just sitting on stage making faces and like doing spit takes and stupid stuff like that that really didn't mean anything. And as soon as I figured that out, I was off to the races and uh, auditioning for colleges. And uh, yeah, I was really raw when I got to college, really, really raw and needed the acting. I know a lot of, a lot of people go to college and like, ah, whatever. And they end up go getting, getting a you know, national tour and then leaving school. I needed all four years of it. Like I needed, <laughs> I needed the, the groundwork and it, and it served me so well over the years. Yeah, what got you to New York? Well, I went to college in upstate New York. Um, I, th I grew up in Texas, right? So I, but I always, you know, I always had this dream of living in New York, even before I wanted to be a Broadway guy. I just thought it was, you know, there's like this you know, magical quality about it, especially coming from a small, not small, medium-sized town in Texas where nobody leaves and everything stays the same and everything's flat. And you're like, look at this big city where anything is possible. And it, it, it was just very cliche, but that's what I wanted to do. So I mean, I went to, uh, you know, I looked for a lot of col when I went for colleges. I looked for places that were not anywhere near where I grew up. Even like my backup schools were up in the Northeast, and uh, went to Ithaca College, which is in upstate New York. So I got to go to New York a few times, you know, during school and check out plays and see things here and there and. Um, yeah, I immediately moved here after I was done. I mean, what else was I gonna go? Exactly. Did you try to get waitering gigs? Oh yeah. yeah. Tell us about those. Well, you know, when I was in college, I never, uh, I worked at the dining hall. I never worked real, a real job when I was in high school. But when I went home during college, I worked at, with my mom at the bingo hall. Um, that was like, <laughs> just came home smelling like cigarettes and. Uh, Cigarettes and debt. <laughs> um, so I, so that was like my job experience. Was that was the bingo hall and the, and you know the dining hall. Yeah. A lot of halls. Yeah. Unfortunately, there were no halls that I could apply to be a waiter at. But um, I, uh, so I did that thing where I, um, well, first of all, I will say first of all, I did catering gigs. Okay. So the first thing I did when I moved to the city was I catered the U.S. Open, which was really fun. And, uh, and at one point, I, well, it was really fun except for when you couldn't eat anything and your stomach's like, oh, I have to eat all this even though you're not hungry. And then you're like in the tiny little hallway where nobody could see you, like bringing back the tray that only had two things on it because you have to replace it. And you're just like, oh. <laughs> just crying because like you're it's starving. not that good. <laughs> and like now I have to pee. Um, <laughs> But I did that, and I did some other catering gigs, but for me, it sort of just destroyed my soul. I mean, you're sitting in a room, you're dressed up, and everybody's having fun and not paying attention to you. You're like, you might as well be a robot. Like, that's what they should make robots for. Not to take people's jobs in, like, meaningful things, but to be cater waiters. Man. That would be the life for a robot, Fabulous. for sure. And then they could like warm it, yeah. and they're like, hey. <laughs> anyway, so I did that for, for a hot minute, and then I decided I needed to make more money yeah. and talk to people. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna try to be a waiter. And so I made a fake resume, super fake. <laughs> and what I, cause you know, all the restaurants yeah. For in New York, if you want to get a restaurant in New York, a restaurant gig, you have to have had three years of experience at least, and you have to know all the systems that you that they use for the for you know for ordering. I was like, I don't know, any of this crap. And so what I did was that I picked all restaurants that I know had closed, either in New York or in my hometown or in Ithaca, and I put them all on there so if they tried to call, nobody would answer. But they were legit places that were now closed. 
I, apparently I worked for two years at the Bennigan's down in Corpus. <laughs> um, but nobody bought it. So like I went all around, nobody, nobody, nobody said, nobody's like, no, we're not, we're not gonna give it to you. And then finally I went to this one restaurant that my friend told me to go to because they liked actors um, called 44 and 10 on 44 yeah. and 10th. Lovely restaurant, really good food. And I walked in, and I had my backpack on, and I was like, this is my last one. It was really, a, this was the last thing I was gonna try, and then I was like, I'm going back to catering. And the maitre d' stands up, it was before they were serving, it was like four o'clock, and he's like, he looks me over, he looks at my resume, he's like, mm. And he looks me over, he's like, are you an actor? <laughs> I'm like, yes, actually, I am an actor. He's like, do you sing? I was like, well, yeah, I do sing. I was like, do they sing here? I was like, he's like, no, it's not a thing. <laughs> And then and he's like looks at me again and he's like, Do you have your book? <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, that your book is like your book of audition songs. Which of course I had on me. <laughs> so I give him my book yeah. of songs. I mean, like they're like bussing the tables over here and like stocking the yeah. you know, wine. And and he opens it up, he's like, sing this. <laughs> I was like, right now? <laughs> Just like a cappella? He's like, yes. So I like kind of like mezzo piano sing through anthem from chess <laughs> and he just like, kind of looks at me and says come in for training tomorrow at four <laughs> and I, I had that job for like four months and then I got a finally got an act my uh, an acting gig and I left I would have been fired very soon <laughs> that is hilarious I was very yeah. very close to being fired on multiple occasions <laughs> well you made your Broadway debut in Rock of Ages Favorite memories of that? How challenging was that show? Um, well, I was a swing in Rock of Ages, right? So that's a challenge in its own. Um, swing is like the universal understudy. So I understudied two, no, three leads and two ensemble tracks. And so at first it's really hard because you're like, oh, I gotta learn all this stuff. But then once you know it all, you're like just sitting backstage waiting for somebody to get sick or fall. <laughs> is he gonna fall tonight? <laughs> How do I make him fall? <laughs> My mom's in town. How do I get him? Uh, <laughs> so, oh no, but it was really fun. But, um, my, uh, but I, didn't, I didn't step on stage until after we opened. Yeah. And, uh, and it was for the lead. And he called, like, a day, I had a day's notice. So I had one day, and I had had two understudy rehearsals, and we had gotten halfway through act one. In those rehearsals, I mean, because you know, I, I know, I know, all, I know all of it because I'm sitting there throughout the entire process. But I've not actually done anything. I've not. There's no costumes. I've not like stepped into the role except for like the first half of Act One, and so we do like a, what's called a put in, which the whole cast comes in and you run through the show like manically before the evening performance. And I had two scripts off stage and one on each side, and I'm just like every time I go off stage, it's like, okay, 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 going with my lines and. Uh, I wore like half of this guy Constantine who I was understanding his costumes. He's literally like a foot taller than me. <laughs> I'm wearing half his costumes, like no wigs. So I'm like trying to make my hair look cool in 80s even though it's literally this short. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but it was great. I mean, it was, yeah. it was wonderful. And I had a lot of people came and, and sort of my family came out and surprised me. And uh, it was it was kind of a it was kind of magical. My first time on on a Broadway stage, yeah. I was playing the lead in a show. I got to take the final bow, and um, Amy Spanger was playing the opposite next to me. And she turned to me right before we walked out um, for the last number, and she said, "Grab my shoulders," and she said, "You are a star." And I like almost started crying. I was like, "I gotta do the show now. <laughs> I gotta go sing. Don't stop believing, and I won't. <laughs> I won't stop." Yeah, it was, it was really great. It was a great experience. And I mean, the f other weird, freaky, funny story about that was um, the writer director for Joyful Noise was in the audience that night, the first, my very first show. And, uh, and he sort of cast me right there on the spot. Hasn't happened since, <laughs> as far as I know, but um, that first one, yeah. All right, well, let's talk about Joyful Noise, incredible oh. film. First film, Dolly Parton, Queen Latifah. Mm -hmm. What was it like being on a set like that and working with them? Oh man, it feels like forever ago. Yeah. That was 2010, nine, 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 10, 10. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, it was great. I mean, they were lovely, lovely human beings and two huge names and uh, really showed me the, the positive side of what it can be like to be a star, to be like a huge, because you hear so many stor horror stories about people that are like just divas or like nobody likes them or they're always yelling or arguing and making the set a terrible place to be, but they're so friggin' talented that they're still getting work and people just tolerate it. And it was, couldn't be more the opposite with them. I mean, Dolly would have given, you know, the man on the street the time of day if she didn't have her bodyguards around her. But, you know, like she, she just was the most lovely giving human being. And um, Queen Latifah was, was equally as accessible and, uh, and also really lovely. So, I mean, yeah, they taught me a lot about how to be a human being on set while also, you know, having that sort of star power. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've been in instances where I've seen the opposite. Luckily, more often than not, it's, it's not that. But I have seen those, those moments where you see people where you're like, oh, I can't be like that. Yeah. Like, but it's so easy to be that way because especially in TV and film, everything is handed to you. You know, you have your trailer and you have all, you have, uh, you know, all the PAs waiting on, do you need anything? Do you need water? Do you need a sandwich? And, uh, and just everything is at your fingertips and given to you. You want a ride? Oh, you, we'll give you a ride. Yeah. Do you want a per diem? Take it. <laughs> do you want my firstborn child? Please have it. Do you want to bring your dog to work and keep it in a little, in your pocket while you do the scene? Great. We'll shoot you from the, from the chest up. Have your dog in your lap. It's great. We love. I'm like, they do that. They they just they because because of actors that yeah. make life miserable for people. Yeah. They over cater to yeah. all actors, yeah. which is kind of nice. But <laughs> but I try to like you know take myself down a step yeah. when I can. Uh, you can come back in again. Don't you want to come on in? You come in. Come on back. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> I love to ask stage actors the first time they're on a TV set. Yeah. Was, was Law and Order SVU? Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. What was your experience like on that? Law and Order SVU. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, it was weird. I, I had a very, well, first of all, I had very different ideas about my character than the director did. And I was like, well, then why did you cast me? But that was a whole other thing. But, um, I would say the best thing for me was, well, there were a couple lessons I learned on that. The, the main one being I had a scene with Chris Maloney, who was like the lead detective on that show for a really long time. And he, in the scene, has to tell me that my girlfriend has been killed. And in the script, I'm like supposed to be kind of not really effect, as affected, like holding it in like dark. And the director's like, oh no, your girlfriend has died. Well, meanwhile, I've been like cheating on her and I don't really like her or whatever sort of thing. So like, and he's also like upper class, like doesn't feel feelings kind of person. All that aside, I'm, so I'm like trying now to emote, like having not prepared to emote, no. trying to like, okay, how do I, my girlfriend's dead. But like, I'm a, I'm a stoic upper class, upper east side New York you know, 18-year-old high school kid who doesn't feel things. How do I do this? And so I'm like, he tells me, and I'm like looking all around like, ah, oh God, how do I deal with this? Like, how would somebody deal with this? Okay, you're not gonna like, you're gonna be like looking down. You're gonna be like just kind of like sinking inside your head. Okay, this makes sense, this makes sense. And then Chris Maloney was like, dude, just look at me. <laughs> I was like, well, that's weird. Like, if you told me that my girlfriend died and I, I wouldn't just like, stare at you like that's creepy he's like that doesn't matter what you would actually do the audience is right here in the camera the audience is this tiny little thing if you're doing this the audience just sees this and this and this he's like if you look at me and i'm right here the audience sees everything happening in your eyes and you just give me that and yeah it might not feel right or like correct like what you would do in real life but is what we see through your eyes that makes us feel, yeah. you know, as an audience, what you're going through. And that was a huge lesson for me um, that I still have to remind myself, um, which I think is a big difference between TV and Broadway acting, but actually not that much of a difference. Because the Broadway stage, while it's big, is not that big. You know, there's a difference between being like, ha, ah, and like, 
Like, you can still see it. You can still see it. I mean, you can see, like, me, you know, do that, as opposed to me doing, you know, like, it doesn't have to be that okay. thing. Yeah. You know? It's like, it's, subtlety is your, is your, is your friend. Yeah. And I am still learning that every day, so... Don't go back and watch everything I did and be like, he said subtlety's your friend, but what is he doing right there? <laughs> Trust me, I've seen it. Yeah. I, I gave myself the note. We're good. Fabulous. I'm still learning. West Side Story, where you played Tony, I've told you this before, but you were one of my all-time favorite Tonys, and I have seen Aww. like, I don't know, 30, 40, totally. Thanks. You got to work with Arthur Lawrence, who could be brilliant, tyrannical, and everything else in between. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And you were young then, too. What yeah. was that experience like for you, doing West Side and working with him? Yeah, that was 2009. Yeah. I did, yeah. Um, I was the two-show Tony, okay. <laughs> which was fun, because it was the best gig on Broadway. I literally showed up twice a week and got a principal contract. Um, but... Um, yeah, when I first got it, <laughs> well, first of all, when I first got it, he, I had my final callback. It was for the replacement. And he was like, where were you the first round? I was like, I auditioned. <laughs> I got a callback. I met you. He <laughs> sang through everything. I remember because I had a sunburn because I came, I left my family vacation in Texas to come there. And uh, he's like, well... I don't know who that was, but this is who I want. I like, Great. Okay, fine. Uh, no offense yeah. taken. Hire me. We're good. So he hired me and, you know, uh, really sort of heaped on the praise early and, like, and, and made me feel very good about myself and, you know, different. He's like, I'd never seen anybody do uh, something's coming like that. Everybody does Maria. Everybody does, like, all this, but never, nobody ever nails something's coming. He's like, you had this energy. And I was like, great. I love you. Um, and then um, we never, I did the show, I got put in the show, and then he would show up like, you know, a couple times a month and bring everybody out in the house and give us corrections and give us notes. And it was always terrifying because he would always pick one person, no matter what, no matter how good or bad the show was, one person got the wrath of Arthur Lawrence. And I, that was just how he worked. And we all knew it, and there was nothing we could do about it. And uh, it was never me until the very last time he came and saw me. And it was like three days before I was leaving the show to do Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah. And um, he was like, you've gone. You've left the show already. Where were you? I was so, I mean, I, I don't even know why you showed up to work today. And I had felt like I had given my, like, soul, like, bled on stage that day. Like, I was a really emotional performance for me. And I, like, I felt like I had discovered new things. And, uh, and I was just like, dude, why do you do this? Like, why are you, I mean, I said this to him, which everybody was like, what are you doing? I was like, what is he gonna do, fire me? I'm leaving in three days. <laughs> I, I don't know if he's gonna be directing anything else anytime soon. <laughs> um, but I, um, uh, I don't want to say that I was the cause of, no, I, no, I wasn't, I wasn't. But I, I just kind of called him out. I was like, what good are you doing? You know, I felt like I was giving a, I really felt really proud of my performance. Um, I took all the notes that you gave me last time and the time before, and I implemented them into this performance, and you're telling me that the things that you told me to do last time, I'm doing wrong. And I was like, I, I don't know what you want from me. He's like, he's like, uh, you know, oh, I see what you're doing. You're like trying to, you know, sh be your like strong male presence and like, you know, assert your your strength over me. I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm trying to take you down a notch, if anything. But like, I I honestly want to know, like, what can we all do so that you're not doing this every time that you come see the show? And it, it kind of ended there because people started getting weird, and I was like, never mind, just. Yeah. And I, I kind of half apologized afterwards. And uh, everybody in the cast came up to me like the next day. They were like, dude, thank you for saying what we were all thinking. But I'm um, glad that you said it because I definitely don't have the balls to say that. But it must have been empowering to do too. When yeah, you I mean, what you I, yeah. Do. it was just weird that yeah. like somebody like that who uses power yeah. 
uh, to manipulate people and to he just, and it was and really what he was saying that I was doing was what he had been doing, asserting his power and his you know male masculinity whatever over everybody, and they all feared him for it. And I was like, that's not cool. You should, people, you, I don't know. It's two thousand whatever nine or ten at that time. Like, you don't need to do that anymore. People, you can talk to people. Well, you were sensational in that show. Oh, thanks. So you know. Appreciate it. You clearly Go weren't ahead. there that evening. What's that? <laughs> we have to sort of talk about Newsies, Newsies fans. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Bonnie and Clyde together. Okay, you received a Tony Award nomination for Best Actor in a Musical for playing Jack Kelly in the musical Newsies. Yeah. Newsies was a life-changing show for you, wasn't it? It certainly was, yeah. yeah. I, um, you know, I grew up watching Newsies as a kid on my little VHS tape. Yeah. came out when I was like nine or seven. One of those odd ages. And uh, I, uh, yeah, I loved it. And, uh, and it's so funny because when I, when I heard that they were making it into a musical, I was like, oh, man, I got to do that. And I never got an audition. <laughs> and then apparently they couldn't find anybody, so they came back and they're like, oh, we forgot to call you in, but you were, we totally had meant to. It's a good thing we've, we remembered because you're so great. I was like, whatever. Because <laughs> I had showed yeah. up. And I was the only one auditioning. I was like, where's everybody else? I'm like, well, we couldn't find anybody. I was like, oh, I see. <laughs> um, not that I was anybody huge at that point, but I had, you know, I was in West Side Story. I'd done a couple Broadway shows. I had, um, um, I had, yeah. So, I mean, I had things going for me. And um, so I got it, and it was like a, it was just a, it was just a workshop. So like a week-long reading of it um, just to see if it was any good. And it was great. <laughs> so we did that, and then like uh, a year and a half later, Jeff Calhoun, who, um, who had directed me in Bonnie and Clyde, signed on to direct it. And he just called me and said, do you want to do it? And I was like, yeah. Uh, no dance audition, I'm in. <laughs> and uh, we did it at Paper Mill, and uh, the rest is kind of history. Yeah. Then Bonnie and Clyde. You yes. were doing double duty at the same time, Well, you? Newsies, the, yeah. so what happened was I had Newsies the, the, the reading first, yeah. and then Bonnie and Clyde happened, which yes. is when I met uh, Jeff, and that was, Bonnie and Clyde happened while, I got, but I'll get, I got that, that's why I left West Side, because we did it out of town, right? So I did Bonnie and Clyde out of town in Florida, uh, which was amazing, got to work with, with, with Laura and um, became great friends, and then when I came back from that is when Newsies happened at Paper Mill, uh, you know, uh, the out-of-town tryout. And then as soon as that was over, Bonnie and Clyde was going to Broadway. So as I was doing Paper Mill at night, during the day, I was rehearsing in the city. Wow. So I was doing a show in Jersey at night, rehearsing in the city during the day to do uh, Bonnie and Clyde. And, um, and then, of course, Newsies was going to go to Broadway right away. And I was in Bonnie and Clyde thinking like, oh, this dream role of mine is going to go to somebody else for Broadway, I mean, I got to do it. I guess I should be thankful for that. You know, I'm doing this show, other show that I really like, but you know, it's, I don't know if it's gonna do very well. And then Bonnie and Clyde closed after all, only a month being open, just in time for me to start rehearsals for Newsies because they hadn't quite casted anybody, cast anybody yet. And uh, yeah, I got lucky. I mean, uh, lucky for me at the sort of, not, not that my luck in that cost Bonnie and Clyde anything, but I mean, I felt so bad for all the people that were doing that show that, you know, had no job, and I just kind of waltzed into another one and did two new Broadway musicals in the same season, which was crazy. But uh, that was the last time I was on Broadway, yeah. 2012. Wow. Then I went on to the TV. Well, let's talk about TV then. We have to chat about Smash. Smash fans? <laughs> well, you played Jimmy on season two. How did Smash come about for you? Smash came about because um, season two got a new showrunner, a uh, fellow named Josh Saffron, who yeah. is now a really great friend of mine. Um, and he wanted to bring a few new characters into the TV show, had seen uh, Bonnie and Clyde and Newsies, and uh, tells me that he wrote the character of Jimmy with me in mind. Now, that's not to say I didn't go through like four, four auditions to get it. and. Um, I had to do a bunch of stuff, but a, 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 eventually I, I booked it, and um, I, we started in, um, gosh, we started in July or August 
and we had open newsies in April or no, open Newsies in like March or February. So anyways, I had been in Newsies for like four months and I'm starting this new gig. And I had like a six month contract in Newsies. So I somehow convinced them to hire me a standby who was Corey Cott, who is now his own oh, yeah. famous person self. And uh, he was my standby in Newsies while during, you know, every once in a while I would be stuck on film, stuck on set filming and then he would come on. So there was like, about a month and a half that I was doing Newsies at night and shooting Smash during the day in Brooklyn. And uh, I think there was like a 35 to 40 day period where I didn't have a single day off, over a month. And I was like, I gotta go. And then what, what ended up happening was that I had built my wedding yeah. and honeymoon or little mini honeymoon into my Newsies contract and subsequently into my Smash contract. So I went from like double duty to like, two weeks off <laughs> and then I just when I came back I I was just doing smash I had left yeah. I left Newsies then after Did like five months it's very sad favorite memories of smash favorite memories of smash you know I met two of my best friends there Andy Mantis and Krista Rodriguez and we just had a lot of stupid fun times on set just uh, what, what was great was that you know season two kind of busted and uh, flopped in terms of you know uh, critical and yeah. ratings, but we didn't premiere until like February, and we had started shooting like I said in July, August. So we had got most of the season under our belt before anybody saw it. So we had this eternal sense of optimism about us for the longest time, and we just had a blast just doing everything. And and um, I don't know, man. I it's the, the stupid little moments are what stick with me. Like you know. Uh, Andy and I pulling a prank on set, or Krista telling everybody all, what happened on my honeymoon because she was so sick of me telling everybody the story. <laughs> so I came back, I came back from my honeymoon, and like everybody wanted to know what I did, and she happened to be working with me all day, so we were next to each other. And every new person I told, she was like, "Oh my god, this again!" So finally, like the fifth or sixth person, I started telling. She was like, Jeremy, he did this, he did this, he went there, he went there, it was great. He had lunch here, he had dinner there, it was great. Okay, next. And then <laughs> I, was like, I was like, suddenly you're my new favorite yeah. person. But like stupid stuff yeah. like that. Like that's what I loved. You like the Three Musketeers on that. Yeah, story. a little bit. Yeah. yeah. We all the, came in together and. Yeah. yeah. The film version of Jason Robert Brown's musical, The Last Five Years. Yes. Yes. Another dream role for me, too. I mean, when I was in college, was right around when the musical was, you know, at its height of popularity in the city. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we all, it was kind of the litmus test for musical theater performers. Like, not the litmus test, that's a terrible, what's the test? The, the bar exam, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's, <laughs> oh, yeah, you know what I mean. It was, the bar, it was the bar, right? So like, if you could successfully get through a last five years number, like you were good enough to go to New York. <laughs> and like, it was like, that was like a thing, like it was yeah. subconscious, but that was kind of like the, the thing. And so like, I knew that whole show by heart almost. And uh, you know, they, they said that they had cast Anna in the lead role. And I was like, well, of course they're gonna get some sort of big name. And apparently they went through a few and they couldn't find anybody that, you know, they, that could sing it well or, or whatever. And uh, turned to us lowly Broadway folk. And uh, I had to kind of fight for it. Yeah. I did, I did. I mean, I went in initially, and I thought I did pretty good, and they liked me, and they brought me back for a callback. And they, there was still a sort of tim timid sort of like, I don't know if we're really sure about this guy. And I, I had to keep coming back in and had to do like one of the funny numbers, then one of the really dramatic numbers, and then the story song. And, um, and eventually, what I ended up doing, which I'm not saying this is what got it, but I but I learned that I can do this, was I wrote a letter to the director telling him why he should cast me. Wonderful. Which was like, what have I got to lose? At this point I've gone in like three or four yeah. times. Um, I, I'm so passionate about this and this would be an absolute dream. So like, how can I be my own like advocate? It wasn't like a like, please hire me sort of thing. It's like, here's what I will bring. Here are all my ideas. Here is what I know and what I can do, and here's how I can even bring this to a higher level, level than anybody else. Like, uh, it was just sort of an exercise in like, 
confidence mixed with humility mixed with sort of passion like it was like it, it was just one of those moments where I realized like I'm in charge of my own career like it's too often as actors we get stuck in that like well this is my one shot I'm gonna walk in this room and if I blow it well throw that away screw that dream that I had and sometimes your dreams are really powerful and really, really um, potent. And, and you can't just get rid of it. Because I know, like, oh, if I don't get this, you know, it's one thing if you go in for an initial thing and it just feels wrong. And you, you can, but if, like, you, you start to get that thing, that sort of idea of, like, what it could be like, and you, and you start to see glimmers that it could still, it might, it might, it might, and then it gets taken away, that's the worst. So, and you know, we're just so often just powerless. We walk in, we do the audition, somebody else makes the decisions. You know, TV and film, you go in, and even after you have the job, you go in, you do a few takes, somebody else picks it, and hopefully you cross your fingers, you look good, and they don't pick the things that make you look stupid, which happens far too often. <laughs> and uh, having some semblance of control or some semblance of ownership of your career is incredibly empowering as an actor. And even if it doesn't work, you know, you tried. And like, there's so many things that you're told not to do. I, most of that stuff, yeah, I mean, it's just, if you're good and you know what you're doing and you're prepared and you can back up what you're giving, do whatever you want. See, great advice. Yeah. <laughs> but you have to be able to back yeah. it up. Oh, yeah. And you have to, you have to, have confidence in it because if you go in there and sing, you know, I dreamed a dream and you're just giving the same bland performance every other girl came in and gave, uh, then yeah, don't go sing dream to dream, sing a different song that's going to make you stick out. But like, I'm also like a big advocate of going in, like when they, when they tell you to go in for a show, a musical specifically, and they're like, bring your book, sing something, sing something not from the show, sing a 16 bar cut of something. I'm like, no. I'm gonna sing something from the show and you're gonna see what the character's gonna look like. Because like, otherwise, why are we wasting each other's time? And if I can't give you, and if I can't prove to you in this initial call that I can play this character, then why am I here? So, that's, that's not saying that everybody should do that, but you know, if you can't, if you have that confidence, then you should. They should ask you to sing for the show. Yeah, sure. sometimes, and no sometimes sense. they do, but sometimes yeah. it's, not, it's not that, and you're like, yeah. whatever. Sharing the screen with Anna Kendrick, yeah, and singing live, yeah, singing live, man. That's that's uh, that was great. I mean, I'd done the whole season of Smash, and you know, we used the same audio guys. I got them in contact so that so that I I had something because I because none nobody else had really done. I mean, Anna had done Pitch Perfect, but all those guys were in L.A. Yeah. and our director Richard had never done any sort of film musical thing, and so like people that knew what they were doing. Anyway, so. But we'd always done pre-records for that because TV is too hard to do stuff live for the most part because it's all so fast and you have to get all the elements together and you can't just do a bunch of retakes and you can't go back and like go and edit it all and try to get it and you have to get all the different angles. It's a whole thing. But with a small movie and like a really close up movie like the last five years, we were able to do that. And of course, we still like, you know, cleaned up things in post, of course. And like there were a couple songs that we couldn't do live because... You know, we were in a car driving down the highway with the hood down, and it would just sound terrible. Yeah. Um, not that we would sound terrible, but <laughs> like the sound quality would just be atrocious, you know. But um, no, it was great. I mean, like, it was hard. Like, yeah. doing the Shmuel song in a, in a upper, um, well, in a Harlem a, um, brownstone in the middle of the summer in a giant sweater with no AC 10 times over the course of like 10 hours full all the way through was, I mean, was pretty rough, but it became like my favorite number in the show. And like doing If I Didn't Believe in You, we did that like 14 times in a row. That's a seven minute song. That's just me. Yeah. And, uh, and we used take 14 in the movie. So it's like, it took that and it just like took every ounce out of us like it was, but it was great because like you could give every word nuance 
when you're singing along to a tape recorder, especially for something like Last Five Years, with the entire movie, 99% of it is sung. Like, if you have to lip sync 99% of a movie, uh, there's no, there's it's just an entire wall of emotion that you're leaving behind while your brain thinks, how do I get that note exactly on the beat, you know? So yeah, it was, it was, it was necessary, but yeah. also, you know, really exhilarating. It was so alive when yeah. you watched it on film. Yeah. Yeah, and it, well, the other thing is we had a tiny budget yeah. and a very small window of time to do it. So one of the things that, I, that I've that i grown to love about it, because I don't know if I always loved about it, but I've grown to love about it, is its imperfection. There are a lot of really imperfect moments in that because, but I think it sort of mirrors the, the story sure. in, a, in a strange way. Yeah. Yeah. You are known to millions of fans for playing Win on the hit TV series Supergirl. Yes. Supergirl fans. <laughs> I got a big one right here. I know she's a big Supergirl fan right here. How much fun was that doing for you? Um, well, for me, it was, it, was, it was a big big deal for me because, like I said, it was a departure from the musical singer dude. Yeah. Um, I really felt like I got to play a character that was much more close to who I was. You know, I, I was often putting on this sort of like, strong leading man face because you know whatever the jaw line and the the notes and the you know uh being a straight man in musical theater is you kind of get boxed into those um you know strong characters and this was like a v sort of fragile funny lovable guy and um i really got to like because I, I always felt like i tried to bring a sense of comedy to everything I do. Even if it's like the most traumatic thing, I try to find the humor in it yeah. and try to bring that out and try to like sort of humanize the character and ground the character in humor. Because generally most people, uh, unless you're like a serial killer, and even then sometimes, <laughs> you know, you, you, if in the ser in like things get too heavy, you, you make a joke, you like try to like Take a, bring a little levity, and uh, and so being the sort of funny, humorous, humorous comic best friend character uh, was kind of like coming home to me. It was like it was like it was like rediscovering Jeremy in a strange way because you know a lot of times you spend your time doing all these roles, you you lose track sometimes of you know the auth the most authentic version of yourself because you bring little parts of yourself to all these characters and sometimes you take parts of them with you and uh, I'm not really one to like carry a lot of character baggage with me but I didn't realize until I did uh, Supergirl and did win like how much I longed to be that goofy weird silly version of myself which people that know me got to see but nobody else did and uh, it was very sort of cathartic and, you know, to, to release that, in, that energy into the world that was just always felt the most authentic to me. So, um, yeah, I love it. I mean, I, I miss it. Um, it was, I, I, it, it, I had to leave the show for, for my own reasons, uh, nothing to do with anybody there or the cast, which I love, yeah. and the character, which I love. It's just, you know, I needed to be back in New York. I needed to... Uh, uh, be with my friends and my family and um, and I need to be back on stage and it, but what's 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 great is I'm going is I am gonna go back and do some more stuff with them so yeah. I'm not done with the character which is really exciting because when you decided not to become a regular character anymore mm -hmm. you got American Sign right yeah <laughs> it's so funny because it's that same idea of taking ownership of your life yeah. because when you sign these TV contracts they're like six years yeah. they're six years and when I signed the Supergirl contract it was in Los Angeles yeah. and I have a lot of friends and I love Los Angeles it's sunny and beautiful I grew up in South Texas it's kind of like home to me like there's the beach there's the hot weather I can wear shorts every day I love LA um, and uh, and after season one, we were shipped up to Vancouver for, for all eternity. Yeah. And, it, and you know, we were talking about this backstage. Vancouver yeah. is like, it's a lovely city in the summer. Yeah. And it's just kind of gloom and doom for yeah. like six to eight months out of the year. It just rains. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the people are lovely and, you know, things are a little bit cheaper because of the Canadian dollar. But it's, 
it, it got to me really quickly. And, um, and my wife was out here. Um, you know, she's also an actress. And uh, we've done that thing where we follow each other before. And it it's, doesn't work for us and for a lot of people. Like, you, you start to lose your identity when you start to follow your partner into whatever their, their gig is. So I knew pretty shortly, because we were going to move out to LA because she could have, like, a career out there. And um, I f pretty, pretty quickly after I moved to Vancouver, I realized I needed to get out as soon as possible. And I just couldn't find that way to break a six-year contract without a lot of red tape. And I you know, just started having conversations with people and, yeah. and uh, was lucky enough to you know, amicably leave the show and, and be written off in a lovely way and still, you know, still be close with everybody and be invited back whenever yeah. you know, uh, they, they need me. And uh, so yeah. It's, it, it, but, it, but it was definitely my decision. I remember I was in therapy <laughs> and I, the, he gave me like a, he wanted me to write out a five year plan and this was after season one. And so, you know, it started with like six months from now and then, uh, you know, th um, a year from now, two years from now, five years from now. And I got to two years from now and I was like, what do I want to be doing in two years? Like, the last thing I want to be doing is being stuck in Vancouver again for another 10 months and like super unhappy and like in the, you know, cloudy gray depression. And so as soon as I wrote that out, I like made it a goal for myself, like to not be there. And two years later, I'm right here. This was about two years ago. So here I am. So, I mean, it's, it's just taking ownership, you know, it's, it's really just like, sometimes ownership comes at a cost, you know? of uh, actual cost in this case, because TV money is nice. <laughs> and Broadway money, less nice. <laughs> so. <laughs> you can go back and forth. I think it's really wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the ideal is kind of to be well-rounded, you yeah. know, so. But I saved up, up enough money, and my wife and I are, are uh, building a house out in Jersey, so it's, it's kind of the dream. It's kind of the dream for us. We have a few questions from the audience. Ooh. This is one for you. When are you recording a live audience? I've been waiting for years. When am I recording a, a, live, a live album? album. Yes. Oh, well, you know, I'm in the process of doing a non-live album okay. first, and then maybe we can talk about a live album. But yeah, I, uh, it's been a dream of mine to put out an album for a long time, but I've, I've done so many you know, theater and soundtrack yeah. albums that I wanted to, to be different. So, you know, I've been writing music since I was in high school. The high school stuff, nobody needs to ever hear. <laughs> but as I got older, I started to get uh, better at it, and I've started collaborating with some people. And, um, yeah, now that I'm back in New York and uh, have a few more resources yeah. and a little bit more time, uh, we've been working on putting together an album of original material, um, it's, Beautiful. it's not a theater album. It's, it's like a pop kind of alternative pop album, which is like my jam. And it's something uh, I have no dreams of being, you know, a huge pop star, but, um, ever since I was a kid, I always wanted to have a pop album, like a, like a pop or rock out, you know, something, something that was like that you could play on the radio. And I always have theater, and I always have all my concerts and symphony gigs and music. And this is, I just wanted to find a new facet to express myself. So that's what we are working on right now. Uh, you know, I've been working on it for a while, but now that I'm back here, um, oh, yeah. we're actually starting to, to get it done. So good for you. Stay tuned. We will have something hopefully sooner than later about, about that to announce. Beautiful. Another question is, what do you consider your most challenging role as an actor or a singer? Wow. Most challenging? I'm just I'm going through the Rolodex. Yeah. Um, you know, this one has been pretty challenging for me. Um, but I would say... You know, actually, I would probably say when I did J.M. Barry in Finding Neverland at ART in Boston. Beautiful, yep. Was really, was really a big challenge for me. You know, it was, um, I was playing a little bit older than I am. I was playing in a historical character. Um, I'm, I was trying to do justice to a lot of things at a time while at the same time trying to help 
build this new show that was trying to find itself and trying to lend whatever bits of my voice I could to the process. And it was also really difficult because I always felt, <laughs> and uh, rightfully so, that I could lose the gig at any time. And um, so I, I really felt like I was fighting for my job every evening, every time I was doing the show. Cause I, and I loved the character so much and I wanted him to grow and find new things. And I was always constantly building, uh, but in the back of my mind kind of fighting against myself and against the producers and unnameable people that we don't, well, person that we don't need to talk about. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a tough, really difficult, but uh, rewarding in its, its own way and, and constantly challenged by the character. But I, but, I, but I finished with a pretty decent Scottish accent, so. I can't do yeah. Irish anymore. I used to be able to do Irish, and then I played a Scottish character, and now I can't. Oh, like, it's, it's one or the other. You were wonderful. Oh, yeah, thank really you. Really terrific. That. Thanks. For those of you who didn't see it, if you go on YouTube, there's some beautiful B-roll footage of oh, you yeah. and Laura Michelle Kelly. Yeah. And I watched it just last night. You see your whole performance through your eyes. Mm. It's so yeah. wonderful. Everybody go home today. Richie! Just bring it up. And watch Richie. him. And I'm up low in smoke. I'm pretty see. sure my tie is askew in that B-roll photo. <laughs> you look see at all the, all the press photos, yeah. it was like the first yeah. dress run. Yeah. And the, we're backstage doing the quick change. Yeah. I'm like trying to get the tie. Yeah. And we didn't quite get in. I had to run on stage. Like, <laughs> I was like, this looks ridiculous. All the press photos, my yeah. tie is like, <laughs> like, what is that tie choice? That's interesting. Is he like a, is he quirky like that? <laughs> I don't know. I love what you actors look at, like in a picture or B-roll. Well, I mean, yeah, it I was yeah. very apparent. Okay. Look for that. Look for that online, too. Look for that. Once you see it, you can't unsee okay, it. Okay, okay. This is from Leah. Do you have any dream roles you'd like to do? Oh. Uh, Classics. That's a tough one because yeah. um, I, I just am a big creator. I'm a, I'm a big fan of creating things. Yeah. Um, I, I will say I haven't really done any proper Sondheim. Okay. So I think I would want to do something. I mean, I've done West Side, which is lyrics by Sondheim, but I think I would really love to do a Sondheim role one day. Yeah, Six, by Sondheim. Six by Sondheim, yes, but that's just a review, you know, like, a, I mean, a real character. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's something that I would want to do. So either Bobby or George, I don't, I don't know. Something. You'd be a great Bobby. Yeah. Great George, too. Yeah, I have some time. I still got my youthful look. Love that. Someone has a question. Is there any musical you, you wish you were in that you auditioned for that you did not get? <laughs> wow, I got to go back for this one. Um, man. Well, you know, there was the whole Finding Neverland thing, but, yeah. but I did get Supergirl because I wasn't doing that. So I don't want to count that. Yeah. Um, and I didn't do it. So it was like <sighs> musicals that I, you know, there's a lot of them that I did audition for that I'm glad I didn't get <laughs> because, yeah. you know, they then tanked. Um, man, I don't know. Maybe, you know what? Here's the thing is like, I, I so, I do it subconsciously now. Whenever I audition for something and nothing happens of it, I literally like cleanse my mind. I like delete. I like format the drive of, of that in my brain and I don't even think about it. So I don't know. My manager Ted's here. He could probably give me some that I could think of. <laughs> which one? Yeah, which, what's one I didn't get? Yeah. Well, that's the See, right answer. That's the right answer. <laughs> Thank you, Ted, my manager. Appreciate you. <laughs> there have been plenty of like, yeah. you know, movies and things that I didn't yeah. get, but I still, I try to just, I just But you it. have to, I think, to yeah. move forward with anything, like mm -hmm. you said. You know, you do the best you can, you push for something if you can. If you get it, you get it. If you don't, yeah. you move on to the next project, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because everything you do is different. Yeah. Nothing, you, if you look at your body of work, nothing is the same. No, I don't think so. I, I, don't, yeah. I don't think that I've, I, I try to everything that I yeah. actually end up do doing, yeah. I try to make it different. And you know, this American Son yeah. being a prime example, you know, playing a 
you know, a, the conservative police officer is yeah. is definitely a new for me. So it's yeah. it's, uh, yeah, I, I'm really excited to see what comes next. Yeah, but you know, talk about empowering yourself. Yeah. You made those choices, and when you make those choices, other great things followed right behind it. Yeah, yeah, it's really about yeah. making choices, and, and and even for me, you know, like I find times where I'm feel stuck. Yeah, and I'm like. Why am I stuck? Because I'm sitting here waiting for something to happen. Yeah. You know, and I, I, it happens to me all the time. You know, and, and sometimes it's little things like, you know, on a daily basis when I'm sitting at home, vegging in front of the TV, feeling, yeah. s wondering why I feel like kind of sad. I'm like, oh, because you decided that you weren't going to do anything today. Yeah. <laughs> and some days that's earned, but some days you're like, I feel like I have more to give the world than yeah. what I'm doing at the moment. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm right now thinking about like last week. I was like, I could have really done a lot more last week. <laughs> so, well, you've done a lot today. You've already picked tile, right? Uh, yes, I went. Out, I was yeah. in Jersey picking out tile for our new house all <laughs> this morning. You got a and lot by me, yeah. I was sat back and said, "That's ugly," or "That's not ugly," yeah. and then everybody else picked the stuff. But I definitely let them know if I didn't like it. Fabulous. <laughs> or. That's too expensive. Yeah, that's a big one, right? We're thinking square footage here, okay? Totally. This is not a closet. That's, yeah. a, that's the master bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of tile, a lot of ka-ching. Oh, my God. You have no idea. We have a youngin here, Grace and Kelly. Oh. Today is my 11th birthday. Ooh. Could you please sing happy birthday to me or wish me a happy birthday? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> What's your name? Grace. Who's Grace? Grace, and right here. This one? <laughs> I don't ever do this, but I'll, I'll sing happy birthday to you, okay? All right? Don't blink. Just kidding. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. What's your name? Happy birthday, dear Grayson. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. You're very that. welcome. Thank you for that. I just have two more questions. You are one of the most humble and sincere gentlemen working at the top of your game in an ever-changing business. Yeah. How do you view your success and stay so level? Well, I don't know that I view it as success. I view it as this is what's happening and this is what I've done and this is where I want to go and this is where I am. Like, if you start thinking, like, oh, I'm a successful actor, then where do you got to go from there? Yeah. Like, I don't feel I'm as successful, as successful as I could be. There are a lot of things that I want to do that I have not had the opportunity to do. There are a lot of things that I want to do that I don't think I'm ready to do yet. There are a lot of things that I have done that I'm proud of that I would go back and do better if I could, but I can't. So it's like, I don't know. It's, I don't really feel successful. I feel like I'm here and I have something to give. And, uh, and that's all I can really do is, is, is try to go day by day and try to become better, be a better person, be a better husband, be a better performer. Uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a daily, struggle not a struggle i don't want to say it's a struggle it's a daily sort of it's a privilege honestly for me i mean i feel privileged i feel lucky to be in the position you know i am in given so many other people in the world who are nowhere near as as well off as i am and um so yeah i mean in that case i i feel like i can't really say oh i'm not successful because there i know are hundreds of thousands of people that wish they could have the level of success that I have had. And I can't like shirk that, I suppose. I can't like say, oh no, but um, I think that if I have that mindset, I, I'm gonna become a different person. Yeah. And I don't wanna be that person. I wanna be the person that's constantly building and growing and changing and, and bettering himself and other people around him. Beautiful. So. That leads into my final question is, what is the best bit of advice that you've been given either personally or professionally, that you live your life by? Well, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I guess the, the, the one thing that I always think of when people ask me that question is my, 
sophomore year of college, my acting teacher um, taught me how to take a risk. And I thought that I was doing it, and I realized that I was playing safe within my bounds. So like you say, take a risk, and you're like, oh, hey, that's not taking a risk. Taking a risk would be like, take this and splashing it all over you, which I'm not actually gonna do. You. But you know what I'm saying? It's like, <laughs> people say take risks all the time, and people take a tiny step. Yeah. But a risk isn't a tiny step, it's like, it's a leap. It's a, it's a leap blindfolded. And, um, and it's a leap blindfolded while, you know, having a parachute you know, ready to go if need be, but it's, um, uh, and basically, you know, what came about because, you know, he, he would give me like a piece of work or a piece of material and I, co and I go and do it and I try to find my own safe way of making it my own. And he just say, no, that's wrong. I was like, so what's on the page? I just said all the words right. I did all the things that it said. He's like, that's wrong. I was like, no, it's not. We got in this huge argument. I was like, no, it's not wrong. He's like, why don't you do this? And he told me something completely opposite. I was like, what? How is that right when that's not what's on the page? And I did it, and it became something totally new and totally interesting. And that wasn't the final product, but it informed my right choices in a completely new way. So uh, it, I think that if we reach a little bit outside of our comfort zone, a little bit outside of our box every day, a little bit more, a little bit more, you know, and maybe we kind of shrink back, but then we can reach back out again. That's when we're going to find the things that change us and that make us grow and that make an impact on people. Uh, same thing with, 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 you know, it's kind of the similar idea with the play. It's, it's finding your way out of your circle and expanding your mind to encompass the rest of the world, you know, like if somebody from Zimbabwe was given this scene, how would they do it? They're given the exact same pages, but maybe they might think of this in a completely different light. Like, why is that wrong and your way is right? You know, so it's, um, I took a lot from that, apart from just like how to approach a scene. I think it's, it's really important to approach life. And it's, it's simple as saying take risks, but it's not as simple as that, yeah. you know? Perfect. Just so you know, I had known you since Rock of Ages. And you had, I had known you since Rock of Ages. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, it yes. It is so great to have watched what has happened to your career. Like I said, you were one of the nicest people oh. working in this business. And I thank Thanks. you for taking the time, sitting here today for all of these people and the people watching around the world. Thanks, If Richard. you haven't seen American Son, go see this man work. Please Ladies do. and gentlemen, Jeremy Jordan. Thank you.